I can second that. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Keyes. Um, there, there are two issues on the agenda that need to be amended. Okay. Uh, item 5G says art investments. It should say ARETE, A-R-E-T-E. -E. And uh, also the, uh, the numbering on the agenda is wrong. So uh, items, what is currently written as items number seven and eight should be renumbered to item six and seven. Okay, noted. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Item 4C, the consent agenda. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Keyes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of items 4A, approval of regular meeting minutes of October 1st, 2019. Item 4B, approval of regular meeting minutes of April 21st, 2020. Item 4C, approval of regular meeting minutes of May 5th, 2020. Item 4D, final plat reunion subdivision phase four. Uh, item 4E, final plat Amazon Falls subdivision phase one. Item 4F, approval and appointment to CHD for development impact fee advisory committee for city of star. Sean Nickel, Michael Keyes, Chris Todd, John Tenson, John Turnipseed and Mayor Trevor. A. Chadwick, and item 4G, approval of the Star Snack Shack commercial lease agreement with Star Snack Shack, LLC. Uh, Star Sugar Shack, LLC. Star Sugar Shack, LLC, correct. Okay, we have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a second, any further discussion? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Keyes. Uh, item, under item 4F, uh, the uh, um, CHD4 Development Impact Fee Advisory Committee is actually only supposed to have five members. And uh, so I think uh, we need to remove you from the committee and designate you as an alternate. Uh, also uh, on the May 5th meeting minutes at the end of Director Wong's comments, it says the mayor asked if there was a classification of roads who can't use impact fees. Wong replied that they could not be used on locals or arterials. Uh, Spencer confirmed arterials and it should be changed to collectors because I believe arterials are the only place they can be used. Correct. And then uh, um, I have a request, a question on the reunion sub. Uh, has the flood designation and other issues uh, been resolved on that? It's a question for staff. Uh, hang on, Sean's getting there. Four D. Uh, yes, those have been uh, addressed. Thank you. And then um, on the Snack Shack lease, uh, there's a, a $250,000 uh, liability insurance requirement. Um, is is $250,000 enough? I, I think uh, um, in this day and age, I, I question whether that's high enough. Uh, and then uh, um, second, if in the, in the past, the tenant of the Snack Shack has not been allowed to operate during uh, our hometown celebration, and if that's going to be the same for this tenant, I believe we probably ought to note that in the lease so there's no misunderstandings. It's, it should be there because we, him and I had a discussion about that specifically. Okay, I looked through the lease. I may have missed it. Yeah, it's, it's in there uh, for that because he understands that he can't operate during the hometown celebration at that location. He'd have to move over to the food court. Okay. Now, as far as the, uh, the, the dollar amount, it was at 100,000. And um, after review uh, with council, um, 250,000 was the amount that was determined that we needed to put on there. Okay, I mean, I typically carry more than that for my homeowners. It just, it just seems that's, that's a light amount, but if uh, um, I'm not gonna argue with, with uh, council. Okay. Anything else? Oh, Sean, you were going to answer the flood? I already did. Oh, you did answer that. Okay, good. All right. So are you going to amend your motion to with those changes? Uh, yeah, I'd like to amend my motion to uh, um, include the changes that I mentioned. And second. And we got a second. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. 
So Jennifer's guys, just so you know, Jennifer's having issues with the internet. So she's going to try to come over here and sit just so you're aware. Okay. Okay, item 5A, public hearing for the Rostai Farm Subdivision is gonna be tabled to the June 16th, 2020 date. Originally it was scheduled, uh, it was tabled till this date um, and we're not doing any public hearings uh, until June. So we need a motion to uh, table that till June 16th. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hershey. I make a motion that we <coughs> table the Rostai Farm Subdivision until the 16th of June, 2020. Second. Okay, we got a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 No, any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. It's tabled till June 16, 2020. Off item 5B, public hearing on the Unified Development Code. And we're going to turn this over to um, Mr. Sean. Mr. Mayor, could, could we, why don't we skip that one until Jennifer gets here so she can participate? Maybe go down. Go down the, can we rearrange well, that? Well, the problem, well, we could go down to the order, I guess. Chris, can we do that? You can take things out of order if you need to, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll move down to the uh, ordinance number 307 for the Monroe Butler property annexation and zoning. Page 296 of our packets. We need to dispense of the rules. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Keyes. I move that pursuant to Idaho Code Section 50 902, the rule requiring an ordinance to be read on three different days, with one reading to be in full, be dispensed with, and that ordinance number 307 be considered after reading once by title only. Second. We got a motion and second. Uh, all in favor? Roll call. I think roll, we need roll no, call. No, it's. Uh, yep. This, this Mayor. Goes. Yeah, um, and members of the council, as the mayor and I were talking today, and I was looking again at the statutory ordinance requirements, the uh, waiving the rules requires a one half plus one vote of the council, but it does not require roll call. But the approval of the ordinance does require the roll call. So at some point over the last several months, we've kind of got those reversed. But um, anyway, so you don't need to do the roll call on the waiving of the rules, but you will do the roll call on the actual adoption of the ordinance. Thank you, sir. We all good? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that motion carries. Uh, um, Oops, sorry. That was... Uh, I did. Kevin, sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, we need to motion to approve ordinance number 307. Councilman Nielsen. I motion make a motion to approve ordinance number 307, Tyler Monroe and Yvette Butler property, an ordinance annexing to the city of Star certain real property located in the unincorporated area of Ada County, Idaho, more specifically at 9990 West Beacon Light Road and contiguous to the city of Star establishing the zoning classification of the annexed property as residential R2 of approximately 20.26 acres, directing that certified copies of this ordinance be filed as provided by law, providing for related matters and providing for an effective date. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, roll call. Aye. Councilman Hershey? Aye. Councilman Keyes? Aye. Councilman Nielsen? Aye. Councilwoman Salmonson? I don't believe she can vote. She on can't this. vote on this one right now, anyway. So that motion carries. We'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Ordinance number 307 passed. Uh, we're right to uh, item number uh, 5G. Mr. Mayor? Councilman? Keys. Move that pursuant to Idaho Code Section 50-902, the rule requiring an ordinance to be read on three different days with one reading to be in full, be dispensed with, and that ordinance number 308 be considered after reading once by title only. Second. We have a motion and a second. 
Any further discussion? All in favor? Sorry. Yep. Aye. Sorry. 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 Hang on. Sorry. Um, I think that the date uh, that was noted in that or, or in the information there, it was uh, referenced as February 12th, but the council meeting was actually uh, February 11th. Hang on one second for us here, Sean. We can make that clerical adjustment before we publish it. And okay. That'll be fine. All right, we'll check on that clerical adjustment there. Any further discussion? No, nope. all in favor? Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Yes, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay, anyone, uh, entertain a motion uh, to approve ordinance number 308? Mayor Chadwick. Councilman Nielsen? I move that we approve ordinance number 308. Arete Investments Telford Property Rezone an ordinance rezoning certain real property located in the city of Star owned by Arete Investments located at 10474 and 10, 10580 West State Street, generally north of the State Highway 44 and west of Taurus Drive or the county parcel number S04083470028 and S04083470077 rezoning the property from limited office LO to central business district CBD, amending the zoning map of the city of star to reflect such changes and providing an effective date, provided that we correct the spelling of the um, of elite investments, as well as the second parcel number. It looks like there's a slash that's uh, included in there that needs to be removed. Second. And the date, yes. We got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Council Councilman Hershey. Aye. Councilman Keys. Aye. Councilman Nielsen. Aye. Councilwoman Salmonson. Aye. That motion carries approved uh, ordinance number 308. On to item 48, or excuse me, 5H, ordinance number 309. We need to dispense of the rules. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Keys. I move that pursuant to Idaho Code Section 50-902, the rule requiring an ordinance to be read on three different days, with one reading to be in full, be dispensed with, and that ordinance number 309 be considered after reading once by title only. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. <clears throat> We need an approval of ordinance number 309. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mayor. Councilman Hershey. Now I move that uh, we approve ordinance number 309, M&M j and &E Properties Rezone, an ordinance rezoning certain real properties located in the city of Star owned by M&M and j and &E Properties located at 10362 and 10366 West State Street, generally north of State Highway 44 and east of Taurus Drive. Ada County parcel S04084348480 and S04084360, rezoning the property from commercial C1 to central business district, amending the zoning map of the city of Star to reflect such changes and providing an effective date. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a second. Any further discussion? All right, so we need to look at the date on that as well, uh, as far as February 11th versus February 12th. Oh yeah, turn your mic on. Yeah. Okay, any further discussion? Roll call. Councilman Hershey. Aye. Councilman Keyes. Aye. Councilman Nielsen. Aye. Councilwoman Salmonson. Aye. Okay, that motion carries. Ordinance number 309 is passed. We're going to jump back up to item 4B, the public hearing for the Unified Development Code Amendments. We're going to turn this over to uh, Sean, our planner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Good evening. Um, I sent you a memo that has a uh, red line list of all the changes that we are proposing in this uh, ordinance amendment. 
uh, we can go through those real quickly. If you guys have any questions, want to stop me? Pull, pull your microphone a little bit closer there. You're not, is that better? No, that's better. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Uh, if you have any questions, you can stop me. I'm going to go ahead and go, go through the chapters. Uh, the, the red lines are on the um, 200 page document, but this will make it easier. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, in addition to these, we can talk about those afterwards. Um, so in reviewing chapter one, I, I did add, uh, I did add one I added on page four, uh, added preliminary plats to the public hearing process because for some reason that was not recognized in 8-1A-6A for applications that require a public hearing. Sean, I, I looked at what you sent us, and that didn't appear that it's that has been been added in there yet. That was the, that was the only one that I added after I sent you the memo. Okay, thank you. So everything else should be um, what you have reviewed. So on page six, we uh, added a thirty-day review notice to agencies uh, for their review. Um, we added uh, on page eleven. We added language regarding reimbursement costs associated with uh, ITD. Give me just a second here. I guess I should have given you guys the, um, so that that uh, that language regarding the reimbursements for, uh, for ITD is on page 11 is uh, section 8.1.B.1 under annexation and zoning and rezone application. Page, on page 14, which is 8-1B-3 uh, comprehensive plan amendments. We removed, we, we removed some of the language based on, uh, based on some uh, public testimony from uh, a citizen and, we, and a, a discussion that we had at our workshop. Going down to page uh, 39, which are the specific use standards. Um, I revised the definition of a guest house and granny flats. And again, you guys can stop me if you have any questions on the, these specific. Page 41, I added a new definition for uh, live work. Going into chapter two, there was no, there was no changes from the uh, previously amend, previous, previous amendment. In, on chapter, in chapter three, page 57, which is section 83A1 zoning districts and purposes established. Uh, I added language, or we added language to the CBD for multifamily. On page 58 of that same section, we, we added some wording um, regarding Timing, let's see, where is that? Timing, timing and ratios uh, of uh, mixed use applications. So residential uses may be part of an overall mixed use development that includes non-residential components not to exceed 30%. That gives you the, the discretion to, to uh, look at those on a case by case basis. What was the timing component of that? Is it, let me ask a question. Is okay. it easier for me to have this staff report up here like this or should I pull up the actual code down below? Probably pull up the code. Code you got, and just you, follow along on the yeah. pages? Yeah. I, I, I don't think I, I can do that. Whatever is, oh yeah, whatever is easier for you guys. You know what I mean? So this is, we're down to page 58 then, right? 
I know, but if I put the page number, it's going to take me to 58 of my document. Not This has everything in there, so this is not really page 58. Uh, uh, Councilmember uh, Nielsen, to answer your question about the ratios, that was some, that was at 30%, and that was part of the, the uh, workshop. Um, so it's not- Right, but you said there was a timing component, and I just didn't get what that was, the uh, racial component. I can't see where we where I changed that. That might that might be a misprint on the memo. Okay. So it says residential use uses may be part of an overall mixed use development that includes a non-residential component and may not exceed thirty percent of the overall size of the development. Okay. I'm a page on page sixty. Under the um, zoning district uses um, under accessory structures. I re I, we revised that to um, make it make residential accessory structures a prohibited use, but to allow uh, commercial accessory structures as a conditional use permit. And again, that's that's so if in the event that you have a business that wants a small shed or storage unit or something that coincides with the commercial use, you'll have the ability to review that on a case-by-case -case basis and make that determination. And then, we, and then we made that a principal permitted use for commercial in the mixed use zone. Okay. Uh, recapping uh, on page 61, residential uses of the CB, CBD uh, changed to prohibit it except for multifamily as a conditional use permit. And that was for our workshop. That was all these right here, right? Yeah. Right. And then again on 61, that right below that, we did add, I did add that the live work multi-use uh, Okay. Use as a conditional use in both the CBD and the mixed use. So, uh, just recapping page 63, we added writing arenas or stable commercial and private as a use. So, we real quick, Sean, yep. in here on the fireworks stands, we changed those the principal permitted uses instead of conditional in those couple of zones. Yes. On here as well. Okay. Sorry, there might be a few of those that I missed in the in my memo here. And then on the, you said page 63 next? Page 63, we added right in arenas and stables, uh, commercial and private. And we, and we removed uh, stable as a separate use and brought it up to that. Okay. Same heading. Page 60 through 64, we, um, Changed classifications per again per our per our workshop, and I won't go through those in detail. But if you have any questions, um, that I guess that, I guess that included those firework stands. Right. And sixty six. Okay, moving on. Um, page sixty six. We uh, I removed the note. Uh, move note four for the sidewalk measurement. We said front yard setback shall be measured from the back of the sidewalk. We removed that statement. Yeah, because it's already on note one. It already talks about it on note one, so it was just repeating it. So. It's 72. <laughs> under 83E1 mixed use districts um, that's where your ratio and your timing <laughs> ended up so I knew, I knew it was in here somewhere so that was that was on your your um, recommendation to have a little more um, control on how uh, commercial and residential is, is, is developed timing wise in a mixed use development. Yes, yeah, see that the council may place requirements on a mixed use development, including a ratio of uses and or timing of phases to ensure that the overall development maintains its mixed use intent. Okay. 
DD2. Oh, I cleaned up our, our, our sign. Uh, Councilmember Nielsen wanted a little bit. Um, he had talked about that, so I cleaned up those sign, those little sign designations um, to show that what where our intent is to have that light shining down and not and not out. So a couple of those have been modified. Is that a change that you made after you sent the packet to us? No, but I, I don't know if you guys noticed that. Uh, I, I had done it actually before the workshop, but we didn't discuss I'm not, it. I'm not seeing that. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Take care of one or take Sorry, my. It's that uh, yeah, figure one where it says allowed and not allowed. Those are different, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. you're saying those are different? Yeah. Yeah, like this, I, I added detached signs showing the, the lights shining from up to down. Uh, the street lights, they were the, the original one had them going out and I, I focused them down to the ground. Just kind of cleaned up the other ones. So they were definitely showing them going down and not and not out. The figure two is really difficult to read. The text in it. Yeah. Yeah, we can. We'll 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 clean that up. I don't. I okay. we'll, we'll find that original exhibit. Have our engineers make us a new one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. On um, page eighty-four, we added. Uh, this was at the request of the mayor. We added uh, eight-foot sidewalks, sidewalk widths, width along uh, State Street in the CBD zone, which basically covers all of State Street and all of most of Star Road. Right. And this is the one that uh, we gave the ITD, so they have it for their planning too, right? Yes. Yeah, they do. Well, it doesn't appear that that covers Star Road. Did you say that it intended to cover Star Road? It's the C CBD. District. It's CB. It's CBD, and so everything on Star Road is. So it says sidewalks shall be a minimum of six feet on State Street. There'll be a minimum of three. Feet. So it's, if, our, if our intent is to cover Star Road, I don't think this ordinance does that. It, it, this one is on yeah on State Street sidewalks and the CBD shall be a minimum of eight feet in width. So just along State is eight foot. The other ones are six foot along the rest of the CBD districts. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I, I misspoke on that. That's sorry, sorry for the confusion. Page 96, um, we cleaned up the fireworks uh, stand uh, tent size, removed the 500 square foot. There's times when they have larger tents or, or two tents that exceeded that amount. Uh, page 101, um, Modified the food vend the tr food truck vendor permit to uh, one year in time. It was originally six months. Page one or two added um, uh, add added a development agreement to the uh, eight four D one the purpose statement for for, for private streets. To allow those as to allow those to be approved in, as a development agreement or through a development agreement. Also, we added, um, or I added, um, at the bottom of that paragraph, um, any private street necessary to provide access and or frontage in association with the public utility or infrastructure facility does not. Uh, and does not provide access to any dwelling shall be exempt from the council approval, but is still subject to fire approval. So an, ex an example of that is the fire, the, the water tanks of above uh, Roselands and Kalina Vista, the, the county, because it's on county land, required a, a um, private road application to get access up there. And so there's going to be there's going to be a you know some times that we're going to have these. Like Star Sewer and Water, for example, they might have to have a private road to meet their frontage requirement, but I don't think it's necessary to bring it through a council approval so it gives the ability to do it as administrative as long as it's not providing uh, any access to a, to a dwelling and it also has to still be approved by the fire district. Right. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Page 
3 we added a sidewalk waiver request it still has to be approved by the council so again there'll be there'll be situations in, in most likely in the larger like r1 zoning districts with the one acre lots where you might want to waive sidewalk on one side or it might be requested so that just gets you the ability to review that so we missed uh, uh the one on 84d3 number uh four a4 which is h on this one i think talks about fire gate uh, gates what page was it uh 102 it's on your little sheet here we just skipped over it it's h for h Gates or other obstacles yeah. should not be allowed unless approved by council and the fire district. And you got rid of through a plan unit development yeah. or development agreement. Okay. And then um, I changed uh, private roads to private streets throughout that section for consistency. All right, chapter five, page 107. One thirty-four. We did. I re, we did some renumbering. Um, page one sixteen added the live work specific use standards. On page one sixteen. Yeah. Okay. Page one twenty-four added the commercial riding arena standards. So on this one, um, yep. is there a reason why uh, under, let's see, A6, it says um, group lessons are provided to the general public for 4 AB? Is there a reason that it's group lessons? Um, I'm just wondering if maybe we should strike the word group so that it would include, you know, private individual lessons as well. well <clears throat> Do we need to discuss that one a little bit? Because this one, any establishment that meets one or more of the following criteria shall be deemed a commercial use and shall require a conditional use approval. So if someone is just giving somebody, just one person a ride, teaching them one person, you want that to be considered commercial? Well, no, but, the, but it's saying for commercial use. So right. if they're charging a fee, if they're charging an individual fee, um, then to me, it shouldn't matter if individual or a group? I think the, the criteria here is when it will be determined to be a commercial use. Right. Yeah, I think so that so you're saying you want it to be a commercial use if they're charging one person a fee. That's first, what you're yes, saying. Right, right. Versus a group. Or either. If it's an individual person or if it's a group. If they're charging a fee period, then that to me is a commercial use. So, so if I invite somebody to my house to teach them leather work, and, and they pay me a fee, would that be a commercial use as well? Can, can you guys speak up a little bit, get a little closer to your microphones perhaps? Uh, yes. How's this? <laughs> Way better, thank you. I think if it's a business use, I mean, if they have a, a license, a business license, if you know, then that like, com their commercial business, if it's a individual or a group, then that would, you know, then they should classify, they should be categorized, they should. I, I agree with that, but I think this, this part of the ordinance is trying to determine when it would be considered commercial. So it's not, it's not prejudging that it is commercial. This is saying that if you've got a writing arena on your property and you're presenting group lessons, then it would be deemed commercial. Gr group lessons with a fee. With a fee. Yeah, yeah, with a fee. And to the general public. Right. Um, but if it's just an individual lesson, you know, like you, you invite somebody over, they, it, you might charge a fee, you might not. Maybe there's consumables. I, I don't know. But and, and I think here also, especially when you're considering writing, that means people are showing up with trucks and trailers and you get a large impact. Whereas if just an individual comes along, um, I'm not sure that that impact is there. Um, so for example, I took some writing lessons at a stable 
and um, I didn't take a truck or my own horse or anything, just showed up. Right. And, um, you know, that was their business. And so, um, so on this section, it says any establishment, establishment that meets one or more of these criteria. So I think, I think the intent was to allow them to do like a piano lesson or a swim lesson or something where one person or tutoring where one person comes to the house, you allow them to do that. That's not necessarily considered a business, but once you get a group together that you're, that are paying, that's when it becomes, then you get trucks, you get trailers, you get, um, you know, the, the neighborhood could be, could be, um, changed because of, because of that. And so that's where I think we want to have it as a conditional use permit. So you guys can review it. What we could do is we could maybe, if, if it's just an individual person, we could have them do a home occupation permit. Um, if it's just one person and treat it, treat it like that. But I'd, I'd hate to require just one person that's going to pay for a lesson to have to go through a conditional use process. Mr. Mayor. Seems like a lot of councilman keys. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with, uh, uh, with staff on this, I think uh, if it's just a one-off deal, I think uh, I'd like to allow um, owners to use a, um, a, a personal arena for that on a casual or occasional basis. If it's for an individual lesson, I'm, I'm kind of happy with it the way it is. I think we have to remember also that this is a, for a conditional use permit. So they'd be coming for us and declaring intent. After that's over, I mean, unless we're going to go out and start visiting riding arenas and monitoring who's going and who's paying fees. I mean, this is unenforceable. This is, uh, well, I don't know, Chief, I guess you could enforce it. You can enforce anything, right? Hmm. So we got you. Okay, that's it's not Well, it's noted. Yeah. We'll okay. say it's noted on what she's saying. And when we get to the end, when we start voting, we can start talking about it. Yeah, and no, Jen, maybe think of how you might want to reword that so that it meets your, yeah, I we can discuss I, that. Or, or think about maybe doing a, a, a home occupation for a single lesson mm -hmm. at, at a time. Um, and then and then the group lessons will be covered under this conditional use permit. So, and to me, it's just a vague, like what is a group lesson? Is that two people? Two or more. Yeah. So maybe, more. So maybe we should just add that to the definition a group lesson, two or more at one time, we could do that. And, and the reason for the conditional use is, is it because of the size of the building? I mean, you, you do a comparison to piano lessons. And well, it could be, it could be an arena, it can be an open arena. It could be an, an indoor, it can be an indoor. Right. Uh, right. arena. But we're not doing conditional use permits for homes where pianos may exist and the potential to provide lessons for one. Right, but typically a piano lesson, you do that one at a time. A tutoring is usually a one-on-one. A one -on -one. Right. You know, and that, that, it, in the home occupation section, it, it's kind of covered that you can't have a whole bunch of cars parked in a, in a driveway. So it's really formatted towards a one-on-one one -on -one situation. Right, and that, that's kind of what I'm driving yeah, at. And here that's what this could be, yeah. The difference of, for this business versus you know a piano lesson or something like a similar nature. Right. This home. business, yes, exactly, exactly. That's why this is a conditional use permit. It's because yeah. of potential traffic and mm -hmm. size of the structure. And right. All that sort of stuff. Yep. Okay. Okay, thank Got you. It. All right. Next there, Sean. 5D, I think. Um, yeah, we are on uh, page uh, 125. I'll just, I just changed the, the uh, dwelling unit to secondary dwelling unit because alphabetically it just, if someone's going to be searching for a secondary dwelling unit, they might not look under dwelling comma secondary, so just, yeah. just for perfect, just, just to make it clear. We had a grammar change on here somewhere too for Councilman Keys. Yeah, um, pay, again, when page 125. Uh, oh, let me find it. Councilman Keyes, do you remember where that? Is that, that at the top of page 125, letter D? 
Yeah, it's at the very top there, D. Oh, there it is, yeah. And chapter six, uh, page 136. Okay. Added access issues uh, to application requirements. So, so we so we added the, the verbiage in here, any unresolved access or traffic generation issues related to ACHD or ITD regulated roadways shall be resolved by the applicant prior to accept, acceptance of any application. A letter from the appropriate transportation agency or survey and property owner shall be submitted with the application. So but by unresolved, we mean, or, or I should say by access and traffic generation issues, those are declared by ACHD or ITD. Is that correct? That's correct. We need to be that specific in the language to specify who can say what's what is a access or traffic generation issue. I, I believe typically the the applicant will go to ACG or definitely ITD beforehand to talk about access, and so at that point they're gonna they're gonna know if there's an access issue, and it's very easy for us to get an email from those agencies. Um, so, sure. I, I'm just kind of thinking of how, how these applications and public hearings go. And, and I think that we may want to be more clear about who can, who has the authority to declare an access or traffic generation issue. Well, so does that, so let me just ask you this, uh, Councilman Nielsen, on that last sentence right there where it says, a letter from the appropriate transportation agency or survey on property owner shall be submitted with the application. Does that satisfy what you're trying to say, what you're saying, or are you saying you want something more? Yeah, I, I think, I don't think that it, that satisfies it because it's a, a war. Um, Mayor, this is Chris. Yes, sir. I, I think the sentence is added because of the project that you had a couple months ago that came in that did not have access established as part of their application. And that it was kind of a, we want to bring our application in and have the city review it without having access to the development. Um, and so what this does is this specifically allows the city to say, if you don't have access and traffic generation is going to be a different issue, uh, maybe, but if you don't have access, then the city does not have to accept your application period. And so as I read this, this language actually allows city staff to not accept the application until the staff is comfortable that the access and traffic generation issues have been resolved with a letter from the transportation agency indicating the same. And so I, this is really more a um, application. This is part of your application requirement. And so this is where your staff can look at it. And for instance, in that scenario that we had a couple months ago, and they could have said, we're not going to accept your application until you get that done and, and send it back. So that's how I interpret the language, especially where it's listed as part of the application requirement. And that they have to have that at least somewhat resolved before it's even going to come to the city and be accepted as an application. And Chris, thank you. I think my understanding of, of the wording here is congruent with what you just explained. Um, the, the concern that I'm trying to raise here is is um, related to really how the public perceives what a complete application is and what they feel like the city should or should not do um, regarding access and traffic generation issues. And I think that by adding some language in there that specifies ITD and ACHD are the organizations who can declare that there's an issue and we resolve the, the potential of misinterpretation um, by the public in this application. But we also need to include CHD4. Oh, good point. In this as well. Yep. Okay. Um, we should just generically say traffic agencies. But the yeah. appropriate traffic agency. Either way. Yeah. Chris, do you understand what he's saying there? I, I do, yeah, because I don't want to, I, I agree, we don't want to open up the door where somebody can just come in and say, well, I, I think the traffic impact study is bad, therefore you never should have accepted this application as an example. 
Um, and maybe the way to do this is instead of putting the language there, um, is it could go in for E on the next page. And that, so as part of streets and all that, that that would include, um, you know, a letter from the appropriate transportation agency, um, you know, identifying access. Cause I, I don't know that the issue is really traffic generation issues um, because I think that ha gets handled in a letter one way or the other from ITD and ACHD. Um, but the access, at least in the recent scenario, is the access is the key, right? If you don't have access and you've got to build a road over somebody else's property or something else, then that should be worked out. Um, and so maybe we just need to massage this, but I, I guess it's up to the council on exactly what data they want. But I do agree with council member Nielsen that um, we don't want this to just be a, a hammer that can be used by any non-applicant, um, even after the applicant's been approved to come in and say, well, the city messed up and never should have accepted this application because in, in our opinion, access and traffic generation issues haven't been resolved. Um, cause we're and resolved is a tough word too. I mean, what, I, I don't know what that means. And so, um, it's a, it can be vague because for some, a neighbor is going to say it's not resolved to my satisfaction. Right. And we're having those conversations right now with a number of different applications in town. And so it's a, it can be a big open door if we don't get the language right. Um, Mr. Mayor and count and council, I, I, let me work with Chris and come up with some well, like he said, we'll massage it, and I, I think I know what your what your reasoning is, and we'll, we'll email it back to you and make sure we we're all comfortable before we put it in the code. Well, let me ask this: Should we prove it as such and then massage it so we have something in place to allow us to 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 um, for back letter term police this issue? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, because if we don't have anything in there, we have nothing for, until the next time we have a hearing. Which could be a month or two. You know, I, I'd be happy to come up with some language to propose here tonight. Okay. Yeah, I. I, I so, so will you work on language, Kevin, while we're oh. while we're going down through the rest of it? Yep. Okay. I mean, you guys understand what the intent is. The intent is to allow staff the ability to not bring an application before you that doesn't have some of these issues worked yeah. out. Yeah, I, um, I think that that's a perfect intent, and I yeah. think what I'm bringing up is. is so, Mr. Simple. Mayor. Councilman Keys. So along that same vein, if we have an application who wants to bring us a project that uh, we believe, um, according to our transportation agencies, is going to exceed the capacity uh, of a road, uh, do we want to accept that application unless they uh, offer um, appropriate mitigation that's acceptable to the agency? Well, I think that's what it's trying to say right here, too. I yeah. think it was and Mayor, oh, this yeah, is Chris. I think one of the challenges we have is at what what is appropriate for a staff level rejection of the application versus what's appropriate for a city council denial of an application. And so, and and it could be either. Um, if if staff from ACHD, for instance, sends a report that says um, the traffic that they're generating is going to be, it's gonna decrease the level of service for a particular road and they need to do X, Y, and Z. And the applicant is refusing that. In my opinion, that's something that they, that the council discusses and potentially denies the application because they haven't done the things that ACHD in this case is requiring to bring the roads up to the appropriate level of service. In, in other words, they've kind of submitted all the all the information that just may not be the information that's satisfactory to the city to solve the issue. The other part is like not having any access to a property. That's something that's lacking. It's not something that's insufficient. And that that point, maybe it's appropriate for a staff level. Now, if the city says, hey, we, before we even look at an application, you better have answers to all the traffic issues that better be part of it. And if you don't have that, um, then we're not going to accept your application. I think you could say that, but I just, I think we need to make sure we're keeping 
the right decision level in the right place so that um, we're not just where the city is not in a position where it can just stonewall any application from coming in just because a staff member, no offense, Sean, may just say, well, I don't really like it or I want more stuff. So we're not even gonna let you submit an application to us until you do what we tell you to do. When the applicant feels like they've submitted all the required information and they wanna you know, have a further conversation with the elected officials. So there's a nuance there that I think we just need to keep our eye on. Um, and just make sure that however we're doing this, we're making sure that we're um, allowing the council to make decisions it needs to make and staff can make decisions that it needs to make. Well, so that report we get from ACHD won't happen until the application is filed anyway, right? And so that couldn't be part of this. But basically, this is basically saying if there's any known or unresolved access or traffic generation issues that we've found out from previous um, reports or whatnot, that's a known issue that we can bring up and say, this is not gonna be accepted until such time that you get this uh, figured out and fixed. Yeah, right. and so for instance, like Ada County, when you submit an application, at least it's been this way in the past, they may have changed. But it used to be when you submitted an application, it doesn't get stamped at the county clerk's office that, hey, we got your application, you're good. Staff takes it, they review it to make sure they've got all the information that they require at the county. And then they will send you a note, a letter that says, okay, we've, your, cap, your application has been deemed complete as of this date, or they send it back to you and say, your application is not complete. And so following how Ada County does it, for instance, if the city got an application that came in, Sean would have the opportunity to review that application, make sure that it had all the information it needed, which may include reviewing the ACHD staff report, assuming it's part of the application. And, um, and then could say, there's more information we need here before we're gonna process this, go back and get it. Um, and so, but we, if, in order to do that, we need to make sure there's some time built in there where the city can review what's been submitted to determine whether or not it's a complete application. Um, and then it can send it back if it's not, and rather than just having a you know, stamp when it comes in that says, okay, you brought it in, um, we'll look at it for a few seconds. This looks good. You know, we'll let, we'll get back to you with a staff report. You know, we need to make sure that we're um, deliberate about taking that extra time to make sure the applicant's complete, application's complete. Yeah, a lot, lot, a lot of times we're we're not going to know some of the issues until ACHD gets our transmittal, which we don't give them until we accept the application, and then they're also reviewing a traffic study in a lot of cases and then given their recommendation based on that, which could be a month after the application is submitted. I think what, I was, what, we, were, what we were trying to do here, we, there, there's two issues. One is access, which we've had an example of, of why we need to have the ability to have the applicant go back and get that access resolved before they submit an application. And the second one is if we knowingly, if, if we know from a previous application that there's a traffic issue, can we um, require more to happen before we accept that application or, or more information? And, that and Mr. Mayor? Councilman Keyes? I mean, that, that's the goal of the adequate public facilities ordinance that, uh, um, that we're trying to put in place with, with ACHD. Um, I think, I think we're, we're also, I mean, I know we're working with them also to try to find some type of uh, uh, an interim uh, stopgap measure until we can get that, but that, that ultimately is the goal of that APFO. It is, but I, th I think we need some sort of language in our code, though, that allows us to, to try to address this early at a staff level. Yeah. And then, do you have something already, Kevin? So I, I, mean, I agree with, uh, with our council and, and Mr. Keyes here that, you know, I, and I think adequate public facilities ordinance level decision should be made by the council um, and not necessarily at, at the staff level. Um, but I, I, I do like the idea of something that is known in advance that, you know, the city just knows that this isn't going to meet the adequate public facilities that, that we have a uh, desire to achieve um, to be able to do that. And so I, I'd like to suggest some language here um, that, that maybe addresses that. 
any known access or traffic generation issues identified by the city, ACHD, ITD, or CHD4 shall be resolved by the applicant prior to acceptance of any application. And then the rest of it reads the same. You think that addresses this sufficiently? I, I do. Chris, what do you think? I, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I liked adding the word known. Um, it, it, for two reasons. One, it, you know, it says that if we know it up front, we can deny your application. Number two, it also opens the door that for the city to continue to review and that there may be other issues that come up after the fact that will still be addressed. So I think that makes sense. I mean, this is one of those that we may have to tweak over time as we get applications in and may have to revise the language here and there, but I, I like that modification. Okay, we move to the next section. Moving on, uh, one. Uh, you, 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 you'll get that. I'll get that from Kevin. Yeah, Kevin? thank, thank okay. you for doing that. Page one forty-three. Sorry, uh, Sean. Before you jump that far, could you go back to one thirty-eight? Sure. Near the bottom of that page is um, F for decision. Yes. At the at the beginning of this conversation, this hearing tonight, you talked about adding preliminary plat under the public hearing section of the code. Um, and we don't have that language here. The Idaho statutes do not require public hearings for preliminary plats when the plat is submitted, when it's not requesting any modifications or anything from what the code says. But if we want to require those public hearings, and I think we need to, as part of F, we need to say basically a decision on a preliminary plat is made by the city council um, after a public hearing and after receiving a recommendation from the administrator. So that it's clear that here as well that there is a public hearing required. Uh, so if we're going to add it to the beginning, I think we need to add it here um, so we're consistent. I, I was looking at that as if the administrator was acting like a planning and zoning commission and making them a recommendation. That, that's how that's how I read that. But I see what you're saying. Okay. One thirty-eight. So at what? Yeah. what yep. I would just add a reference. So I would just say a decision on a preliminary plat for a parcel land is made by the city council. Um, after a public hearing and after receiving a recommendation from the administrator. So I think we need to add, if we're going to require public hearings at the beginning of the code for preliminary plats, like you mentioned earlier tonight, then I think we need to add that reference here as well. So we've just got some consistency in both areas. That's probably why it was out of that section earlier on. Yeah. Yeah. The state code doesn't require the preliminary, the, that preliminary plats go through public hearings. Um, Many cities, um, most cities do require it, but um, so whichever way the city wants to go is fine. I just want to make sure we're consistent. So we're, we're assuming that the council does want to have that ability to review those. I mean, usually you're going to review them with multiple applications like annexations and zoning, but there will be times when you have a piece of property already zoned and there'll be a preliminary plat and that... Yeah, and the, the and it would still come to council for an approval. It's just whether or not it's open up to the public to come in and talk about the plat on its own. And the um, the way the statutes are written, you know, the the landowner has entitlements um, based on the zoning that they have, and so they look at the code and they say, okay, this is what the city requires me to do for my plat, as we've just started discussing. And the argument is, is that if they do everything the city's asked them to do, then the city should approve the plat. There shouldn't be, um, there is, it's not necessary, necessary for the public to come in and start throwing other things at the plat that aren't part of the code. But if they want to do a variance or something that requires a conditional use permit or something else, all of those will require um, public hearings. And as you identified, if we're doing a plan unit development or it's part of an annexation and rezone, um, then there's public hearings there. So again, it's up to the council. Um, 
whether we do the public hearings for every preliminary plat or not. But uh, I just want to, again, I just want to make sure we're consistent both places. So then it's so the, the, either way, the council will approve it. It's just a matter of whether the public is involved in that conversation or not. Otherwise, it's almost treated like a final plat. It's almost a, correct. It's in a yep. I think Boise City does that, but most of the other cities have them as a public hearing. I think you guys want it as a public hearing because then you can review transitional lots. You can review, you know, you know, things like that that you might not get a chance to look at if it's administrative yeah. approval. Okay, thank but you, Chris. Okay, 143. So on uh, page 143, 86B, two under improvements standards, um, based on discussions with the mayor uh, and looking at some of our um, approved design built uh, subdivisions, um, it's been the, the decisions have been made to require the, the 36 foot uh, street width, which we've kind of been requiring anyways, but it wasn't in the code. Um, so that establishes that as a, as a, as a standard even though ACHD has the ability, had the ability to reduce that per their policy manual. Um, we've had a couple of instances where we've realized that ACHD did approve those without us knowing. And we can see the difference between the 33 and the 36 when you've got park, cars parked on both sides and you're trying to get two cars to pass at the same time. It's, it's not easy to do. So that's the reason for that addition. Okay. Question? No. Okay. Okay. Page uh, 145. That was that, that was, this is that homeowners uh, association language that uh, maybe either Kevin or Michael brought up that we've kind of massaged uh, I just want to make sure everybody's okay with, with this. When it gives them the ability to do a one-time amendment. Yeah. With a, by a simple majority, right? Is that, that's how I'm reading that, right? Versus, yeah. Yeah, essentially th this is to let the homeowners have the opportunity to make their covenants and, and conditions and restrictions uh, work for them. As, as it sub transfers from a development into homeowner control, the goals of the CCNRs and the association change a little bit from a developer interest to, to the association's interest. And some things are, are better done from that different perspective. So this gives them that one time ability to, to quickly get that done. And then uh, Michael found a, a um, error, an, an of instead of an or, so I changed that as well. Okay. That was also on page 146. Okay, chapter seven, planned unit developments uh, on page 148. I'm sorry, going back to page 146, I didn't see that change of O to R. And three. Yeah, I believe it's it's on my master plan, uh, my okay. master copy. Yeah. Okay, and I'm sorry for my delay, but um, also right. regarding the homeowners association. So, um, I noticed you know that we have a lot of stuff in here about landscaping. Do we want to put any thing in there like you know? that some of that is preserved or can they go in and really change whatever they would like in their home CCNRs, including tree distance and, and you know, types of fencing? It's actually a really good question. Um, is it one, once we approve the landscape plan and we sign off on a final plat, we kind of leave it up to the the uh, homeowners association, if, if a tree dies, tree tree die, dies, they're kind of responsible for making sure it gets replanted. Um, and a lot of times that doesn't happen or, or, or they could even 
take out a bunch of trees and we would have no real say. I mean, we've, we've, we've got some language in the landscape ordinance that, you know. So we could add something in there as a 3F that states for any, any condition, you know, original condition of approval upon the, the plots or uh, the stuff that's required in Star City Code, something to that effect. The homeowner association shall follow the approved landscape plan, the, the city approved landscape plan may, and maintain the. So, so item three there, the CCNRs and bylaws amended using this reduced majority shall not be used to, and if we had a generic statement in there, you know, to uh, alter, alter landscaping requirements. Uh, or, or any other condition of approval. Yeah. Of the original, uh, original plan. Yeah, say alter plans or conditions approved by the city. Then at least we have the ability to, at least we have the ability then to go back and say, hey, you're not, you, you, you need to bring that back up to code. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good catch. Give me the language one more time. I was half writing. Shall not, shall not alter plans or, or conditions, conditions approved by the city and should we say as part of the original plot or does that matter? I think if we just say approved by the city, we're done. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Seven. Page 148. Down towards the bottom. Yeah, but I, I just I added this language: the approval of a pri of private streets shall not prevent access and or interconnectivity to adjacent properties or otherwise create unreasonable development opportunities. And that's just once it's a once it's a private road, ACHD kind of kind of backs off on, which is kind of why we've got we got into that situation where we're in that situation on Crystal Springs, for example. Um, ACHG just kind of says, okay, you guys got to figure it out. When we're looking at new developments, we want to make sure that we don't create issues that someone in 10 years is going to have to figure out because we didn't require interconnectivity or the ability for properties to redevelop adjacent to. Okay. All right, chapter eight, almost done here. First five, the first five, the first, yeah, the first five, we, um, of the signs we, we, we'd already discussed at the workshop. I didn't, we didn't really change anything there. Um, those included the, the addition of an animated sign definition on page 152. Um, Many uh, menu boards drive through added on page 160. Uh, off-premise signs revised on page 160. Uh, signs exempt from this this chapter uh, revised on page 171. On page 152, under the animated signs, it's still listed twice in the copy that I have. Um, I think that's second one. Is Oh, there is two on here, Sean. <laughs> Sometimes you stare at those, those all day and you don't see so, it right so we need, in front we need of delete the, We need to delete the one that's not highlighted in red. Yeah, the one, the yes. one that's not highlighted should have been struck. So. Correct. Good catch. <laughs> We do we uh, uh, a num number five under that on my memo. Uh, signs not requiring permits revised revised the page, including removal of prohibition of flagpoles in the backyards, and that's on page one seventy three. So we struck out a bunch of stuff, right? Yeah, that that was all through uh, Chris. Had that those were Chris's. Um, that was 
part of that uh, yeah. Supreme Court ruling. Is that correct, Chris? Right, because these are um, signs that are regulated based on content, <clears throat> right? So you have like real estate signs, political signs, construction signs, they're all content based regulations, and those are no longer allowed pursuant to the US Supreme Court ruling. That's why you guys see a lot of red with lines through it. <laughs> okay. Um, we also, um, per your rec the council's recommendation, we re we removed the bike uh, parking standards. Um, we realized that or, or I, I put them in there because I thought that, that that ordinance had already been adopted then we found out that it, it really hadn't and so Michael did you want to discuss that well I, I think at some point we need to uh, um, look at that and and determine if we want to include that as an ordinance I mean that was that was the whole point of of uh, bringing it into the discussion so um, I think it's beyond the scope of what we're doing tonight but uh, I think at one of our upcoming workshops we should review that language and and uh, um, and then have that conversation. Yeah, I would I would like to bring that back to the council along with the uh, design review section, so we can and then and eventually the new sign ordinance, so we can mm -hmm. go through all those. Okay, so all the bicycle stuff is being pulled. In page two of five. the uh, landscape ordinance. Under, under um, uh, item 10, cert certific certification of completion. I added, um, so it says, the certification of completion shall state that the installation of all landscape improvements, and I added, and amenities if applicable, because um, when, we, when we get a, a landscape plan it usually includes fencing it includes like a tot lot a playground um, those are all part of that landscape plan so we want to make sure that it's that it's uh, certified that those amenities are, are put in with the landscaping or they're bonded for um, and so that's why i wanted to add that language there and then that was prior to issuance of the of the certificate of occup occupancy a signature of a final plat or release of a bond because, um, for example, a conditional use permit wouldn't have a plat associated with it. So I want to make sure that it, it, it is part of the certificate of occupancy and then a signature on the final plat or the, the bonding of that plat. We have an issue right now that we're working on uh, because uh, this was a little unclear. So this will help us in the future. And finally, Page 210. Under, uh, uh, under N, alternative methods of compliance. Uh, e, uh, requirements from outside agencies or jurisdictions such as uh, transportation authority, irrigation and drainage districts, uh, fire districts or utility companies. And then I guess on the next page, we, we added, we revised that tree guide to be the Treasure Valley Tree Selection Guide. And that is it. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions of staff before we open it up to the public for comments? Hearing none, I think we have Chris Todd from the public that wants to comment. And we'll give it just a second and we'll get him added to this. Can you hear us, Mr. Chris? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. How's everybody doing? Thanks for having me. Uh, Chris Todd, uh, business address 53 North Plummer, Star Idaho 83669. Um, just one comment that I wanted to kind of backtrack on um, that I brought up at a couple workshops was 
in the zone in the table um, for the zoning ordinance when we get into allowable and uh, conditioned or conditional uses um, in the different zones. Um, if you recall, we talked about uh, retirement homes um, and retirement homes being kind of a um, a use that um, I think would be applicable to have as a conditional use in the central business district. Um, I'm not asking for it to be an allowed use or permitted, even though I think that that could be on the table, but just a conditional use, which would be similar to these uh, four other zones um, that are conditional use areas for a retirement home. Um, there's actually nowhere that it's actually permitted um, anywhere in the city. So um, as we look at an aging population, as we look at a central business district that you're trying to get uh, foot traffic in and also for people to spend money, um, one segment of the population that's gonna have those things is your retirement communities. Um, and so to be able to have it as at least a, con a conditional use, the city could have eyes on what that looks like um, and have more detail or more, uh, ask for more details if that does come to fruition. Um, similar, you know, with uh, kind of we talked about before, but um, I believe assisted living, uh, looking at the table, uh, where would we go? While Chris is looking for that, I'll, I'll give you the definition of retirement home in our uh, chapter one. Retirement home is a residential establishment shared by eight or more persons, 55 years or older, or their immediate family where care and supervision is not provided. So where do we have assisted living now? Because there's not a... Uh, there's, a, there's a nursing and residential care facility that is conditional in the CBD zone. That's assisted living. And, and a lot of times what you'll find is there's places where they might have um, nursing or residential care facility, but then there's also some independent living. Um, so, I mean, independent living or retirement living, I think it's kind of synonymous. Or if you want to throw the nursing and residential care facility in there. Um, I, I just think that it should be a conditional use. So if somebody does have a good plan and it makes sense um, and they think that, um, that they have a chance with the city um, to, to show them that product, that it, it, it warrants having a conditional use. Um, there's no other, um, there's nowhere really in the city that it's allowed. Um, so having a little bit more opportunity for that to come through, I think is beneficial. Chris, uh, this is Sean. Um, those uh, independent living yes. orders, are they are they they're rented, right? They're not they're not owned. That's correct. So you could put that in your request for the with the assisted care facility, and then council could look at that on a case by case basis, and that would be part of the that would be part of the facility. Right. Um, I mean, what up? I guess another part of it would be like the CD you're trying to do, um, say, high density housing on top of commercial use. So, what happens if somebody wanted to put retirement condos on top of um, hair salon or meds, you know, or, um, offices or some sort of commercial use? Um, I think that that would qualify for a conditional use permit in the CBD too. Yeah, if I remember right, we did have a lot of discussion in um, about retirement and assisted living and nursing home in CBD because you had because Chris, you have brought this up to our attention. Um, and I think that we went back and forth a lot about it. And um, because we decided in the dwelling, um, there was no dwellings, there's no multi uh, family 
um, allowed in the central business district. So, it's, it's or yeah, but then we added that live work multi use. So now that that's been added, I mean, personally, I'd be willing to, you know, I'd be up to change that to conditional use. If it was used as a multi use thing, or Like at that point, do we have to declare it that it's for retirement? Well, I, I, I think that Chris was talking about a definition of 55 and older, whether you're retired or not is different. But I think this is bringing in jobs. So, you know, you have a facility that is employing people. Um, Yeah, most of these most of these facilities would have um, some form of um, a lobby area, um, obviously amenity area that needs to be taken care of. That it's, there has to be somebody on site um, to almost like a, um, a concierge or um, uh, just somebody to assist people that are in that building. Um, some of them that I've seen also include um, uh, food or the, oppor the opportunity to sign up for a food plan or a meal plan. Um, and then anything else that has to deal with amenities. I've seen some that have actual like beauty salons in them or barber shops. So the people that live in them would just walk downstairs to a barber shop, um, have their coffee. Uh, maybe socialize, and then they're out the door to take a walk to downtown Star. Um, I think that there's, you know, there's a lot of flexibility and ideas. And I think that as we're aging into this cohort of people to have more options for them to live in a downtown area next to commercial options for them to walk or bike to is beneficial to the CBD in the long run. Any other questions for Mr. Todd? From anybody? Chris, you got more to say? Yeah, I got a couple more things, sorry. Uh, when we're looking at uh, that same um, matrix, the matrix, um, there was this part in there that talked about, and I know we kind of went over it again a, a little bit, was automotive, auto, automotive, excuse me, automotive hobby and then I believe in um, towards the end of the zoning ordinance, we we're just going through that it kind of spelled out that that special use. Was that correct, Sean? For automotive know. hobby. Yeah, for automotive hobby and that kind of list of. Was it in there? Yes, uh, chapter five goes into the kind of the standards. Yeah. Um, Up here. Um, I mean, one thing, I don't know if it's, if it's relevant or maybe it's just something, I guess, to discuss. It's not a break or make for me, but um, automotive hobby to me would be, um, you know, some guys have a hot rod shop where they have a couple of cars in there that they're um, turning, you know, um, um, redoing or turning into something, um, you know, that's show worthy um or uh where was that chapter five page, one, page 109 is the 109. sorry i'm just trying to go through this as i'm talking be gentle on your mouse there though <laughs> i did that before and then it went all the way to the top again all right, Sean, you said 105? 109. 109, sorry. So this basically gives someone the ability to restore a car or two within their, within their garage, as long as it's not done as a commercial use. Okay, if it's a commercial use, is that allowed in the CBD district? Like say I had a, a Corvette club and all I worked on was Corvettes and I wanted to have a fancy um, 
um, Corvette or hot rod shop to redo them um, and have minimal amount. Would those be allowed in the CBD? I, I would believe that would be under the automotive, uh, mechanical, electrical repair and maintenance. And that's right. a conditional use permit in the CBD. Okay. So that would be a conditional use. Yep. Okay. Um, that was it for me. Okay. Any questions of Mr. Todd? All right. I believe that was all that have signed up to speak at our hearing. So we will, <laughs> we will close the public hearing and open it up for discussion and deliberations. Anybody? You can bring up your, your stuff. Oh, no, sorry, I jumped the gun, I guess, earlier when I brought up, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I kind of stated already my- De Jennifer, can you move closer to your microphone, please? There we go, can you hear me better? Yes. Um, and it's not my eyeball. <laughs> um, so we did talk about the retirement home, nursing home, assisted living in our workshop. And if I recall, you know, we had a lot of debate about it. And I think if I'm remembering correctly that we decided to, um, our final decision to make it not permitted was um, in the central business district was because we didn't have any residential in that area. Is that correct? We had, I thought we had it as a conditional use permit. Uh, well, now um, with the addition of the live work multi use, there's a conditional use permit allowed that then it could be allowed in the CBD. Just a second here, my battery was dying, so I turned off my computer. And so for like apartments that would fall into multifamily, correct? And that is not allowed in the central business district. Correct. Yeah, so, so it, it currently is a conditional use permit and assisted living in the CBD. Um, I, the question was more of a retirement home that- Right we want to consider as part of the, maybe as part of the live work to allow those on an upper floor. So um, I'm sorry, you're saying that it is, a, an assisted living is allowed as, yeah, a conditional. Conditional as a conditional use permit under the, under the, um, under the, um, nursing home. Uh, nursing home. Okay. And so, the, and nursing home is technically, I mean, that's, that's where there's staff. Staff and, uh, and medical and, and, and all that. Right. Because I, I, I believe we determined, I've, I've talked to Chris about this and some different people, that um, that is a commercial use, that a assisted living yeah. facility where you're, you're, you're employing people to take care of people, you've got a doctor, um, is, a, is a commercial use rather than a residential use. I believe that's why we wanted to keep it in there as a conditional use permit. So you guys could review that on a case right. by case basis. So if a 55 and older complex wants to come in and say they have um, a barber, you know, hair, night nail, they have a, I don't know, coffee, whatever they have. Um, and it brought jobs. I mean, you know, it's employee. So it is a commercial business in addition to the, you know, apartment living. Um, you know, I think that that's something that we should consider in that area. I, 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 I agree. I, I think it, it should be a conditional use permit and look at it, especially if it's going to be on an upper floor, because we do allow multifamily on the upper floor in the central business district. And so, so I, we don't have that definition in here for just uh, like 55 and older independent living. It's not in this table right now, correct? Well, we, we ha it, it is. It's under um, retirement home. But it's not allowed in the CBD. That, and I read you the definition that says that it's a 55 and older, eight eight occupants or more. So you're asking um, for us to change yeah, the CBD right. to 
co co uh, yeah. a conditional use is what you're saying. Yeah, so asking, yeah, to change a retirement home, which would include then the 55 and older independent living facilities yes. yeah. um, uh, to be conditional in the CBD. Correct. Yeah, yep. Any, any other discussion on that? Everybody agree with that? And also, I mean, I think it makes sense for access. You know, a lot of, um, you know, wider sidewalks, um, ADA compliant, you know, to get different places. Um, I think, you know, if they want to walk to the store or whatever. Your senior center has closed yeah, yeah, the by. senior yeah. center, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think it makes Mr. Mayor, sense. so just to clarify, uh, we're talking about taking uh, the retirement home specifically and changing it in the CBD from an N to a C, is that correct? That's correct. And yeah, I, I, I don't object to that. Okay. Um, I, I, I do wonder, however, um, if we're looking at expanding uh, the, um, the residential uses in the CBD, if we should then contemplate going back and adding a timing component to it, uh, like we um, are proposing in the mixed use area. Well, but we're not at it. Really? I think I'm trying to understand what timing component would that be, though, for a, for a facility that you're building that's going to have this stuff yeah. all put inside of it? Well, I, I, I think that the CBD is, is considered primarily um, a commercial area. And if uh, we get projects, for instance, that, uh, that say, well, yeah, we want to put in this retirement home and and we're going to put out, you know, this these this auto parts store and a bakery out front, and then we approve it, and then you know suddenly we get the retirement home, but the bakery and the auto parts store don't come. Um, you know, that's that's I think kind of the the problem we are trying to solve in the mixed use area is um, that we approve this mixture of uses, and then all we ever get is the residential. I, I think it's going to. Uh, this is Sean. I think it's going to be on a case by case basis. If if someone's proposing a self-contained building that's going to have units downstairs that are designated as commercial and residential upstairs, it's going to be built at the same time. And we're going to make sure there's conditions on there that those downstairs units cannot convert to residential. They might not be leased out for a while, but they'll be there and they'll be available. And that's, that's, the, that's, I think our intent in the central business district is to promote that downstairs commercial. If you get more of a, facility where you have and we've seen we've seen them proposed in the past where maybe you have residential on the back detached residential or a little component 25 percent or whatever townhouses and then you've got commercial up front I think that's where you want to have the ability to put conditions on timing on you know 50 percent of the commercial needs to be built before the residential component or, or something so like that so you're saying add the same language we have in the mixed use and the CBD so. language, basically, yeah. is what you're saying. I think that's right? what Michael's saying. That, that, that's what I'm suggesting is, uh, um, you know, I, I don't see that there's any harm in adding the language, um, but, you know, sometimes projects come at us with a twist that weren't something that, uh, that we had, had ever contemplated as we went through our, our code updates. Um, and I think having the, the, the flexibility of the council to, uh, um, to impact that timing could become valuable. Um, Mr. Mayor, so what I'll do is I'll add the c consistent language in the CBD that matches the uh, mixed use regarding timing and ratios. Okay. Any comments on that? Sounds good. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilman Nielsen? I think one of the concerns that I had in general about this, and I think it's easily addressed, but you know, Chris brought it up. He mentioned that a lot of these places they have like a barber shop or a hair salon, um, you know, those type of businesses in them. And I think that we would want to make sure that those type of businesses are open to the public and not just contained within that community, um, because this is our, our commercial space. That, that's really the hesitancy that I have, and I think we all generally had is we don't want to give up that that commercial space for. I would I would agree with that. I think that it's important to to make it public that commercial area that uh, it should be public. I mean, that's just it's. And I believe uh, area. Councilman Nielsen through the 
public hearing process and the conditional use process, you guys are gonna be able to review that and you can place conditions on there. Um, I think if we beef up that CBD section on timing, we can accomplish that. I, I think we're all in agreement that we don't wanna, we don't wanna set it up to where you can sneak your way around to get residential. Our intent is to have the commercial, uh, the majority of commercial in the CBD. Correct. Yeah. Any further comment on that? Okay, any other discussion on the code? Okay, I guess I'd entertain a motion to approve, deny or table. Mayor Chadwick. Councilman Keyes. Sorry, Mayor Bell. <laughs> I mean, you got it right this time, that's fantastic. But you didn't get Councilman Keyes. Oh, Councilman Nielsen, I apologize, yeah. <laughs> I deserve that. I didn't get it right. I deserve that. <laughs> Hey, that's a great compliment too. Sorry for you, Michael. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion that we we approve uh, these these amendments um, with. How, how should I state it? Do you, have you noted all of the the changes? Because I've noted a few of them here. With the changes as discussed. So, the motion is to approve with changes as discussed. I have a motion second. to have a, a second. Second. Okay, we got a second. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just uh, um, look at this code as a, a continual working process. And I don't think that, uh, you know, this is the last word by any means. Um, I'm really happy to see that the city's engaged in uh, getting this code updated and uh, that we continue to tune it. And, uh, and I'm look forward to continuing this as we go forward. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 And none opposed there? Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Uh, th that is approved. Thank you. That was pretty, that was pretty long. <laughs> so now we're going to go on to item 5C, the discussion of the heart of the city sub area plan. And I'm going to have uh, uh, Councilman Keyes talk about this, uh, the, about this plan. So the, um, the the plan you have in front of you or the document you have in front of you uh, is uh, um, a draft of the uh, sub area plan that we've been talking about uh, since we adopted the comprehensive plan. Uh, the sub area plan basically is a deeper dive into planning the area south of the river um, essentially between uh, Canada and Highway 16 uh, all the way to Chinden. Uh, the, uh, if you've looked at the plan, the um, intent is for us to come up with uh, um, a much more detailed uh, plan, uh, including a concept plan of uh, uh, what we envision that uh, area to, uh, to become in the future and uh, recognizing that uh, that potentially could be much further out in the future. Uh, I think that with the um, uh, the project that Star Sewer and Water is undergoing uh, to extend sewer uh, down to Joplin at this point, uh, getting that area um, uh, under some type of a concept plan is becoming more urgent. Uh, I, uh, as you know, we already have a couple of developers or at least one developer who's uh, um, approached the city and, and is looking at putting uh, uh, some residential in there. Um, um, so I'm hopeful that uh, uh, that you'll support this, and uh, Mr. Mayor, that you can we can get this uh, added to a request for proposal and get this out and, and underway uh, as soon as possible. Chris, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yes. Is this one so, that the that the council needs to vote to to move forward on for an RFP? Um, it'd be, yeah, since if it's going to go out, it ought to be something that's done with, um, you know, consent of the council. Um, and then we'll do the RFP to get a planner, um, or whoever the right person is to do this work. Obviously when it's done, then it'll go back through a public hearing process to be adopted as part of your comprehensive plan. Okay. Mayor Chadwick. Councilman Nielsen. As our agenda lists this as a discussion item, are we able to take a vote on this tonight? 
Yeah, it, it, Chris, it's under it's under the action items, but it says discussion on here. Um, if it's under action items, it's still technically. I mean, it still is an action item. Um, it's the agenda is maybe not the most artfully worded as it could have been, but um, I think that. Um, a lot of agendas, what you'll see is a section that says discussion items, and then they list those and they have action items and list those. Now where everything under that action item is listed as an action item, um, and it doesn't say discussion only, um, I think that you could still take action on it. Um, again, this will come back um, more than once in front of the council. I mean, when you actually finish the RFQ process and then appoint somebody or hire somebody to do the work, there'll be a contract there that'll come in front of the council. Um, and then it'll, once the work's done, it'll come back in front of a public hearing process so the public can comment on what it looks like and further approval by the council. So whether you wanna make it a, um, just kind of get direction from the council on whether to move forward that's probably fine, but I think you could still make a motion since it's actually listed as an action item on the agenda, even though it uses the word discussion to kind of describe what the agenda item is. Okay. Does that answer your question there? Councilman? Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hershey. Just a quick question. Do we have a possible estimate of cost? We don't. I think that's where we put this out for the RFP to find out what that cost would be before we would move forward on it. All right. Because I'm just trying to figure out if it comes up a lot, what do we do? If it's minimal, maybe you could just go into your budget or purview. But I usually try to figure out a cost before I go RFP, but that's, that's something that I have to do in the government. So, but I'm all for this period. So I'm just wondering. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Keys. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have a, uh, uh, we did budget for this in our current uh, fiscal year. Uh, whether that budget's the right number or not remains to be seen, but uh, but we did we did set aside money in this year's budget. Might cross fiscal years, but that's okay. Okay, Enter entertain a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion. Okay. Let's see if I do this right, I'll make a motion to a um, well, uh, prove this uh, scope of work, and um, what do we and move forward with the RFP? Move forward with the RFP. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, if we're accepting this without changes, I can resubmit this, and I'll just remove the word draft off the. Uh, uh, off the title on the bottom. Noted. Um, I do have a couple of just comments. Um, one thing that I noticed, uh, this is great. Um, I think it's a great document. Very excited to get started on this. Um, and it is in our comprehensive plan. So it's, you know, we're, we're implementing our comprehensive plan. Um, but I did, I would like to see maybe some additional verbiage about um, a little more focus on economic development, along with um, there's a way that we can, um, you know, preserve the uh, rural character, just to include that in this scope of work so that when it goes out to bid that, you know, the proposals, you know, they're just, you know, keeping that in mind as they give us their ideas. Okay, any other comments? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hershey. I agree with what Jennifer said, but I believe in the phases that have been listed out in this uh, document, uh, with all the discussion, interaction, and going back and forth, that the look and feel of what we're looking for is gonna come from the public and city council reviews that happen. And I would agree with that. The only, I just, just in the, um, just in the beginning. You just know, as a the, direction. Exactly. Right. right. Like a preamble? Yeah, just yeah. it, yep. So you want to revise your motion with including that? Yes. <laughs> and I'll revise my second. Okay. All right, so we have a motion uh, and a second uh, revised to include economic development 
and preservation of rural character as part of the um, as part of the uh, preamble, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, for this um, sub area plan. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Okay. That motion carries, and we will work on that RFP. Okay, item 5D, discussion and ratification of draft cost proposal for traffic signal study. Um, let's see, that's on page 282. Add a new color to them? I'm sorry? I just said you wanna add a new color? Yeah. So, so this is a, a traffic study that we're looking at doing um, between um, Highway 16 and Seneca Springs. Um, with our discussions uh, that I've had with ITD and with uh, the developments to the north of Highway 44 and the stuff going on on the south. Um, we are looking at doing this traffic impact study to see if we can reclassify that section of road to allow more uh, signals um, versus the one just at Plummer. Um, and this is at the, at, at, after discussion with ITD saying that, that they would entertain that, uh, that motion if if this traffic study comes back in that favor. Um, and so this traffic study would be done by, I think we'd have a first draft by July um, and a final draft, I believe to be presented uh, to, uh, to ITD in August, um, which it, the hopes would be that we would have a signal um, with this at Moyle, at Plummer and at Seneca Springs, plus the one at Highway 16 when they do the redesign. Um, so this is a, a big significant breakthrough that we've had with uh, ITD in, in this discussion, uh, believe it or not. And the reason we're using six mile engineering is to piggyback off of the current traffic studies that they've done for the environmental study for the widening of Highway 44, because um, they want to make sure that's done. Uh, if, the, if, if, if this, they got that environmental study they got to have in order to continue with the widening project from Linder all the way through. So you want to utilize the same folks that have all the data to make sure that this information is going to be correct uh, for that environmental study as well. Is that right, Sean, how I worded that? Yeah. Any questions from anybody on this? Uh, yes, Councilman or Mayor Chadwick. Yes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so that was one of the questions I had was about um, if we need another bid or. No. Well. And then the other one was, I noticed on the page numbers, it went from page one, three, and five. And so I'm wondering if this information is complete that we have. And I see Moyle Road, but not a detail about Plummer. The Plummer well, Plummer, Plummer's already getting the light. So okay. there is not a need for the study. This study is based off of the comments uh, from ITD. Um, and our request for lights at Seneca Springs and at Moyle. Okay. And they would look at slaving these things together. I mean, there's a whole process. And basically, if they reclassify this road, it allows quarter mile spacing for lights, which is the, where those streets are at versus the half mile on the current road structure. Okay, so all it is a complete document. It's a, yeah. Even though the page numbering is off. Okay, just wanted to make sure that there was nothing missing. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Keyes. Uh, assuming that uh, pages two and four are, uh, are not uh, off in the ether somewhere and ought to in fact be included in red, um, I'd like to make a motion that we ratify the draft cost proposal for traffic impact signal study. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Good job. All yeah, Mr. Favor? Mayor. Yes, Councilman Keyes. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned that this is a breakthrough. I, I think that this is this is critical work in uh, opening up uh, a lot of the undeveloped land in our primary economic corridor to economic access uh, so that it can be developed uh, to help uh, um, with the economic development of, of uh, STAR and also help bring our property taxes, uh, our balance between commercial and residential into balance. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Finally on 5E, we're on the amended STAR Fire Department Agreement and uh, our legal counsel is gonna talk about this real quick for us. Yep. 
Um, so as you recall, um, a couple years ago, the city entered an agreement with Starfire to um, join forces to buy the uh, building there on the west side of um, Star Road. And that agreement contemplated doing an amendment once we were getting close to that being completed and um, when Starfire was able to get their bond approved and those sorts of things to kind of set up the repayment. Um, and so pursuant to that, um, Starfire's attorney uh, went through the doc or prepared this new document, which is in front of you, which will um, basically allow Starfire to pay the city back um, in the appropriate amount. Um, the only kind of caveat, which is not, in my opinion, really an issue, is the original agreement said that there would be a red line document provided. Um, I suppose if the city wants to enforce that, uh, you can, and we could insist the Starfire provide a red line, um, but I went through both documents side by side. Um, basically what's been removed are the things that have already been completed or that are no longer relevant. Um, and, and Mr. Gregory responded back and just said, you know, he can provide a red line, but he felt like doing a new document was what made the most sense. Um, and so, again, minor issue, but I want to just bring it to your attention because it's not a technical 100% compliance with the original agreement that the city ended into before. Um, but again, I think it's immaterial. So uh, my recommendation is that um, the city go ahead and adopt this um, as it's drafted. And uh, that, again, will uh, kind of open the door to allow the city to be repaid um, the money that it put into that building. Any questions for Chris? No, nope. and they're going through the appraisal process right now for your information over there for that uh, station. They should have it by the end of the month. And then we can have discussions on whether or not, because we have first right of refusal on that station. Um, this one right here, yeah, next door to become part of the city's property if we choose to. Um, so any, any, any further discussion on this document here? Okay, I would entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hershey. I propose that we approve or accept uh, the amended Star Fire Department agreement as shown and with the uh, comments noted uh, from uh, Chris. Okay. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? Okay, no, no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Thank you. All right, we're on to item six, which is the reports. Nothing for the chief, uh, Sean? Since we've got the uh, ordinance taken care of now, at least for a little while, and satisfied, um, the next thing I would like to uh, bring before you, and I'll work with Chris and the mayor, is um, when we start looking at our uh, comprehensive plan uh, map. We've got some things we would like to clean up and discuss, so uh, I'm going to start that process and bring it back at a future, okay. near future date. All right. We'll start with uh, Councilman Hershey. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Sorry, Chris, do you have anything to report? Uh, nothing else, Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Hershey. All of my stuff's running normal. Hopefully get back to normal meetings and all that soon, but uh, we have a workshop after this and I'm just gonna end my report there. Okay, Councilman Keyes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I did attend uh, uh, a couple of interesting meetings, uh, both of them with you, one with uh, ITD, where we uh, discussed uh, this proposal a little bit. We talked uh, um, a little bit about the uh, intersection of uh, 16 and floating feather. We talked a little bit about our proportionate share agreement, um, but it's, uh, it was encouraging to see that, uh, that we're moving forward and that we have been developing a great relationship with ITD. Uh, we also had a meeting with uh, ACHD uh, where we uh, discussed the uh, um, intersection of Highway 16 and Floating Feather um, 
and uh, uh, the, the intent of the meeting was to see if we could uh, get them on board to begin uh, the process for them to accept that plan. And uh, um, we had a very encouraging meeting. I'll let you fill in uh, additional details there since you were in that meeting as you see fit when you get to your comments. And then uh, I attended a meeting, uh, the board meeting for the Star Sewer and Water District. And uh, they covered off uh, on a couple of their project uh, statuses. Uh, expansion project they have going on uh, is, uh, um, is on schedule. They're going, uh, moving forward with that pretty aggressively. Um, I also spoke with them about, uh, um, more specifically with Jack Kirtley, about the potential of uh, uh, using their right of way along Lawrence Kennedy to extend the, uh, the walking path uh, that currently exists in Pinewood Lakes all the way into downtown Star. And they're uh, um, in general okay with that, but uh, really want us to, to get together with the, uh, um, with the ditch company. And I think I've given you that contact information. Um, and then uh, uh, we talked about um, the, uh, uh, their extension of their sewer and water south of the river. And uh, their timing for having that lift station um, online is uh, currently uh, uh, looks like uh, uh, they're shooting for March of 2021. So they're they're moving forward with that uh, pretty aggressively. Um, that's all I've got for now. Okay, Councilwoman. Um, yes, uh, I had uh, the monthly air quality board meeting yesterday via Zoom. Um, they are starting to send out their uh, emission testing notices. So um, they put it, they halted them temporarily over the last couple of months. And so, we, you know, it was, there was nothing going out. So um, the stations are open and you may be getting a postcard if you are due. And um, there may be a line because there is a backlog. They test a number, you know, every day. And so there's going to be a lot of people. So just be patient if you're waiting in line. Um, and then Expo Idaho Citizens Advisory Group that I sit on, um, we haven't been meeting, but they are planning to restart. Um, we'll have a meeting in the middle of June. Look forward to that. And um, Pathways and Beautification Committee, they haven't met, um, but I, I believe they're going to meet at the end of this month or they will be meeting next month. Um, and regarding the dog park, I believe that they submitted your their equipment request to you, Mary, Mayor. Mm -hmm. You got that? Okay, that's all I have. Councilman Nielsen. I have not met with the Boise Metro Chamber of Commerce for, for quite some time, uh, so nothing to report there. Um, and I was unable to, to attend the meeting that was took place with our newly hired economic development specialist uh, due to conflicts with my employment. Um, so perhaps, Mayor, you could elaborate on, on that for us. Um, I was able to meet with Councilman Keyes to look at uh, the Pavilion Park area. Uh, we kind of walked along there. There's a drainage ditch that goes through there. Uh, it was my, my heart's desire to see us preserve a, a water feature over in that area. And uh, after some careful examination, it does not appear that uh, that, that is a feasible uh, thing to do. So it was good to get out and, and take a look at that and, and kind of envision what that space looks like in comparison to uh, the way it is today, what it could be in the future compared to what it is today. Um, I was also able to take a walk with, with Mayor Chadwick uh, over at our property at 960 South Main uh, and along uh, some area that uh, is potentially to come into the ownership of the city, uh, including some ponds and, and natural space there along, uh, along the Boise River. Um, talked about some ideas along that. And I really uh, felt like that was a, an exciting adventure. I, I think our city has a lot of potential to, to realize from that property over there. Um, it's going to be a good spot for our city. I think we have some great things coming. Okay. Um, just a few things here. Um, I, I had a meeting with ACHD today uh, regarding the integrated five-year work plan that we submitted, and they are actually starting some scoping work on some of the projects uh, that we submitted on that plan. Um, they hope to have a draft out to us around October, 
uh, about the timing about uh, of some of those projects there. So that's good news. I mean, this is the I don't think we've had that before. So we're, <laughs> we're doing the scoping stuff. So that's that's fantastic. Um, City Hall is now back open uh, for business inside uh, the DMV. I will tell you, I felt like a rock star yesterday. I had people sitting out in chairs waiting to get in at 7 a.m. out here. So I had to go out there and talk to them all. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, but it's the DMV is open. Um, just to give you a little bit of yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, they, they processed 80 titles yesterday out of our little DMV, and Meridian's processed 120 yesterday. So, I mean, and they're much bigger with 10 staff, and when they only have two here. So they went through a lot of folks out, out here, which is awesome on there. Um, the 960 Main Street uh, uh, project down there with the house, um, Keller is on board. They got an architect on board as well. So we'll start seeing some design drawings, which we'll bring to the council uh, here in the near future. Hopefully we get that project done uh, down there. And, and you know, with, with the ponds, uh, talking the fishing game, uh, they're gonna start stocking those. I, I met with uh, the developer on that as well. And we're hoping to get this all completed and turned over uh, within a year uh, on that property, which would be fantastic for all the citizens of STAR and all the opportunities it's gonna provide uh, for our youth and, and our families and individuals um, over there. Um, let's see, hometown celebration. We are going to move uh, the hometown celebration, the parade, um, the, uh, the luncheon and all those functions uh, to August 22nd and the kids games to August 22nd and, and do an end of the summer bash. However, we're going to continue on with our fireworks show on July 4th. Um, the fireworks show, um, I know a lot of people are excited about it. Um, and I think it's the right thing to do to, to bring some normalcy back to, um, to the citizens of our, of our community. Um, you know, it's very, it's very important that people still, you know, practice the proper hygiene and stuff like that. Because no matter what we think, the virus is real. We just got to make sure that we we are doing the things that we can to to support our businesses and our citizens, and and everybody as a whole. Um, with that said, we have a lot of businesses uh, that are open. Um, we have a lot of folks. We have businesses in Star, and we have a lot of uh, uh, people that own businesses in other areas of our community. And I would hope that everybody would go out and support these folks because they need it now more than anything uh, to keep them going. Um, on the uh, fireworks show, I believe we're going to still have some music, but not necessarily a band, but it's going to be other music. Yeah, the fireworks will be synchronized to music, and we're going to have a little bigger show than we had last year, which I think will be exciting. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else there that I was going to talk about on that. And we'll get an announcement out to everybody here in the next couple of days so everybody can start seeing that and get excited for that. Um, no. <laughs> uh, with that, um, I believe that is, oh, economic development, I, it's the same issue. I didn't, I, the meetings are at a wrong time for that. You're talking the, the, the director's meeting that they had, um, that was today at, at noon. Yes, they had, a, they had a meeting today at noon that I couldn't attend because I had a previously scheduled meeting. So we're going to be on those meetings starting next month with her. No, no. So uh, to answer that question there, but she did meet with Sean here yesterday for us to, to get some information and talk about different things uh, for economic uh, uh, development here in the city, which is fantastic. So um, with that said, uh, oh, I hope everybody got their uh, ballots done by eight o'clock tonight. Yeah, you request your ballot by eight o'clock tonight, and we just remember that the, the ballots won't all be counted until the first part of June on there. So I um, appreciate everybody for all their work. Um, our city is moving forward. We just need to keep everybody, you know, uh, I guess cool, calm, and collect a little bit as we, as we move through this new normal that we have for right now and try to get back to the normalcy that we're used to. So, all right, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. This meeting is adjourned. Stay on for the work chair. Mr. Mayor, can we take a five minute break before we start the workshop?
Yeah, we, sorry, you didn't hear any of that. Yes, we'll do, do a five minute break before we do the workshop. And are we staying on here or is there a different link? No, there's another email with a different link. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, we talked earlier, did you need me to attend the workshop? No, Chris, you're good. Okay. Thank you. Good night.